Welcome and hello, champs and buds, to another episode of the Keeping Carlson Short Shifts Podcast. I am your host, Ben Burnett, and joining me, as always, my co-host and yours, Lewis Ezekiel. Lewis, how are you doing tonight? Feeling really good. Happy to be back on the regular schedule. Lots to talk about today. Lots to talk about. We are back. Hockey is back. Doesn't it feel good? Yeah, it's definitely a nice... uh, to be able to expect it every night, you know, not have to go big stretches. The The off days were really weird and not super exciting all those nights. So uh, it's good to be back on a regular, regular old schedule. Yeah, it feels good. I, I assume it feels good for every single person, maybe except for Peter Laviolette today. Uh, that's probably a pretty good assessment. Uh, maybe John Hines makes up for it to be excited to be back behind an NHL bench So for of, a good old thrashing by the Bruins. Right. So, of course, I am referring to today if John Hines has taken over as head coach from Peter Laviolette in Nashville. And we do have one game of data to look at. I think there's a minute left in this game as we're recording. The Preds are down 4-1. to one. Lewis, what is your overall take? We'll start just with your overall take on the the hiring and the firing itself. Do you have a sense of which of these coaches is a better fit for Nashville? Uh, well, I won't say that I watched a ton of New Jersey games over the last few years, um, but you know it's interesting to see Hines get picked up. He was apparently roommates with Nashville's assistant to the general manager at Boston University, and no one else was interviewed, so it seems like they sort of had their idea in mind of who they were going to pick, uh, even before LaViolette was let go. Um, although they talked about it, you know, they talked about it being considered ever since last year's playoff exit. Uh, at any rate, there are some interesting pieces of information out there about how Heinz might influence uh, Nashville that I thought were kind of interesting and sort of influenced my thinking about this hire. On the four check, the Preds SB Nation blog was using some uh, coaching isolates from Micah Blake McCurdy at Ineffective Math. Uh, and basically they use these tools to try to look at shot heat maps and look at how effective teams are at suppressing and creating offense. Uh, so Peter Laviolette was about 3% better than league average at suppressing offense, um, but was sacrificing a lot of offense, it seems like, to do it. He was 13% below league average at generating offense over the last four years, according to Michael's metrics. Uh, Hines, by contrast, was able to suppress offense 9.7% better than league average and only generating 1.2% below average offensive production over his last five seasons. Uh, so it seems like whatever Hines does in his system, he's able to suppress opposing offense more effectively without having to make as much offensive sacrifice as Laviolette had to do to play better D. I do always get a little skeptical of some of these metrics, mainly just because it's so it's such a long sample with a coach behind the bench of like years and years and years and then players come in and players leave and you know you're you're changing your system based on your personnel or your goaltender and as we all know like goaltending is wildly variable from one year to another so what worked one year with a goalie may not work the next so i do however obviously defer to micah who has put a ton of work into a metric like this so to an extent i do find it helpful and he has been banging the drum uh about how the pred should be firing laviolette for a long time now yeah and you know i think what we want to keep in mind is this is one piece of evidence uh, that may be useful for us while we think about it, not necessarily that this particular metric is the end-all and be-all. But it was pretty surprising, especially considering the teams that they've been able to put together. Um, you know, we've often complained about how the Preds' offense seems to be much weaker than it really should be with the type of talent they have. And we're going to find out, it seems, whether how or how much of that, I should say, uh, may have been LaViolette's system. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, to I'm, Micah's numbers credit, I do agree. Like, I do think that this is a positive thing for offense in Nashville. Just look at a player like Forsberg and the level of play that he drives. He's just been such a dynamic forward for so long. To see him tap out as like a 70 to 75 point player has never really made sense for me. I, I do think that this raises the ceiling for the Predators as an offensive team despite the results of tonight's game which it looks like it is now five to two um and i or six to final for tuca and the bruins but i'm not gonna draw 
any wild conclusions off of one game, obviously, but I do think that the ceiling long term is raised for, you know, Forsberg, Arvidsson, Roman Yossi should all be beneficiaries. And then I still, I kind of feel like I did before the season started. One of Rijo or Duchesne should have a, an uptick, whichever one gets to play on that top unit, or, you know, maybe he does decide that he wants to have a more balanced attack. We saw that for a little while in the middle six in in uh, New Jersey with Heinz earlier on this year. So I, I think that I like the offensive ceiling in Nashville a little bit more. And who knows, maybe this is what the uh, goaltending needs as well to bounce back. Uh, any thoughts on the Preds forward group there? I'm with you. I think that it would be really exciting if we could see the Nashville power play really start to click again. Like you said, there's so much talent out there at any given time. Uh, they're supposed to have a ton of depth down the middle. That's what adding tourists was all about. Uh, and so if they can get their offense really rolling, especially if they can get some power play going, um, I think, you know, with some sustained success, which is not something that has been characteristic of Nashville in the past, I think it'll be really you know, to Heinz's credit, and it would be exciting to see for a lot of fantasy owners. And hey, two power play goals tonight. It does look, according to Natural Stat Trick, like they were rolling a Forsberg, Johansson, Arvidsson, and a Granlund, Duchesne, Yarncroke second line. It looks like Heinz was mixing and matching on the power play. I see a shift where Smith, Forsberg, Turris, and Benino played together on the power play with Matthias Ekholm. And then later on in the game, they ran out a Roman Yossi, Arvidsson, Johansson, Duchesne, and Forsberg. You know, traditional top-heavy units. So I'm not going to run anything... I'm not going to overreact to anything based on these lines, just because I'm sure John Hines still doesn't 100% know where he's going with this. But, you know, the Forsbergs... Uh, the Yossis of the world, those players are already on rosters. Are there any that you're taking a look at on the waiver wire right now that you'd be interested in? I think Mikhail Granlund had a goal uh, in this most recent game on Tuesday. Uh, he's been up and down, I think, on the waiver wire, like kind of a top waiver wire player for quite a while. That's somebody who I might be looking to pick up, especially if, you know, Heinz decides to settle on that, you know, uh, high powered top unit. Uh, he could be pretty interesting. You know, I think Kyle Turris is kind of interesting. He really has made good use of the limited time he had, but remember he spent a good chunk of time uh, scratched at the start of the year, so that has depressed his overall season numbers. Uh, if he's kind of let uh, out of the coach's doghouse under this new regime, uh, maybe he could take a turn for the better just to kind of show off that he still uh, has some offensive skills there. Yeah, I mean, if you're in a league where Yossi, Forsberg, Arvidsson, Duchesne, and Johansson and Granlund are all gone, then that's when I would start to look at Turris. If you're in shallower leagues, I mean, I'm seeing that Victor Arvidsson is about 70% owned in Yahoo. So if you're in a if you're in a shallower league, I could see him being on some waiver wires. Matt Duchesne, just under 60% owned. So same with him. You know, these are the kind of guys that I would be more interested in in shallow leagues just as a, a short-term stream and then see what happens with John Hines behind the bench. You never kind of know how these lines are going to shake out in five or six games from now. So yeah, I do think, as I said, I think this is a good opportunity to see uh, a little bit of an uptick in in offensive production in Nashville. Of course, Ryan Ellis is out right now. He took a bad hit to the head from Corey Perry in the Winter Classic which was terrible to see. Honestly, it was like two minutes into the game. I'm sure that I'm not breaking news for anyone right now. I'm sure all of our listeners are well aware of that hit. It was a pretty big deal at the time. Um, on the power play, we did see Yannick Weber get 30 seconds of ice time and Ekholm and Yossi pretty much evenly split the other uh, the other power play opportunities. So that's kind of where we're at with the Preds right now. We'll be keeping an eye on that as time goes on, and I'm sure Brian and Elon will as well. We'll see how those lines shake out over the next few days. Yeah, sounds great. It's going to be really interesting to see how they do for the remainder of the season. I think, you know, if Heinz can replicate some of those uh, defensive and offensive numbers that he was able to, to um, create in New Jersey, according to uh, Micah, then uh, we might see some real positive momentum for uh, the Preds moving forward in fantasy. All right, we'll move on with another headline here. There this one is, you know, a little bit of my speculation, but I think we may be moving into a bit of a goalie controversy in Carolina. Peter Morazic is not having the start that 
Canes fans probably wanted to see him have. I remember him struggling a bit towards the be- in the beginning of last season before he turned into a solid 1A option in Raleigh. Mrazek has started four straight games for the Canes with three starts below 900 until tonight when they decided to go with Reimer, not in a back-to-back situation. Reimer has a 914 on the year, much better than Mrazek's 901. And prior to tonight's game, Reimer had saved three goals above average in 16 starts relative to Mrazek's 28 games, minus three goals saved against. So, you know, Mrazek has been worse than the average goalie should have been, despite being behind a pretty stellar Carolina team. Reimer didn't set the world on fire tonight, but he did get an overtime win I guess I'm I'm wondering, are both of the Canes goalies kind of droppable the same way that they were at the beginning of last season when we were seeing the 1A, 1B with with Mrazek and McElhenney? Or do we need to be holding on to Petr Mrazek at this point? Well, I, I, think move, I think you make a good point that moving forward, we might see much closer to a time shift. Um, you know, certainly that might have been more likely if Reimer had managed to get a more impressive win tonight but a win is a win and it does seem like if that's the case uh, I don't think you're going to see a ton of people rushing to grab uh, players like Mrazek off the waiver wire if you drop them there's a lot of other interesting options out there Um, you know it's sort of been that way all through the season every time I've thought about grabbing Reimer I'm like well yeah but Frank Kuz is out there or uh Auntie Ranta was out there when uh, he was briefly healthy uh, and filling in. So I, you know, never went after Reimer. And I think um, Razik was probably a safe drop, especially if Reimer starts to get, you know, two of the next three starts potentially. Yeah, I did look at Reimer today as a possible spot start, and I wound up deciding to roll with uh, Cam Talbot against the Blackhawks instead, just because Reimer's recent starts had kind of scared me off him. I'm glad that I didn't. I mean, he did get the win, as I said, but four goals against in that game. Uh, Cam Talbot's game is not quite over just yet, so hopefully I don't regret saying that. But yeah, I think both of them are kind of droppable at this point. I wouldn't be against dropping Petr Mrazek. If there is a starter or even a 1A type on your waiver wire, I think that Petr Mrazek can join them it's just that you may want to keep an eye on him picking things up because the Canes are a strong team. And if he winds up getting the lion's share of the starts down the line as we get as we head towards playoff time, he could become very valuable later on. Uh, so I have a question for you. We've got a kind of 1B ascending, Mraz is a 1A, possibly waning. Um, would you rather pick up as a free agent Mrazic or Samsonov? Or would you, I should say, would you rather drop Mrazek for Samsonov? Yeah, I think that I would make that drop. I would rather, if I could get a Samsonov start, I think that I could stream out Mrazek right now. As long as, like I said, I would want to have the the safety of seeing another player who I know can get the lion's share of starts on the waiver wire so that I know that, you know, Mrazek isn't the clear best player out there. But for now, I don't think he's a must hold in a lot of leagues. Not all, but a lot. We'll move to Montreal next, where Ilya Kovalchuk has now played two games with Montreal, 19 minutes in his first, 21 minutes in the second game. He has three assists in these two games, five shots, eight hits, and two blocks. Are we ready to call Ilya Kovalchuk a must-own in all formats? Must own seems <laughs> probably a little strong. But I do think, I do think uh, that this is as interesting as Kovalchuk has been, you know, uh, since he came back from the KHL. Uh, just being surrounded with some degree of talent, it just was such a wasteland for him in LA. Uh, and it was clear that both sides had kind of soured on the idea of his being there. I think it's really exciting to get him into Montreal. Uh, he had some pretty funny quotes after the game. Uh, which I thought were great talking about how uh, he's hoping to give the fans more reasons to cheer his name, uh, which I thought was, you know, appropriate amount of swagger for coming into a new place and getting uh, a number of points right away. Uh, he seemed good in that game. Um, it was the Habs on the second night of a back-to-back, and they unfortunately uh, were able to lose to my Detroit Red Wings, who I've pretty much flipped the switch into uh, Dernier for Lafreniere mode with. 
Wow, that's big of you to admit that this is a lost <laughs> season in Detroit, where I think that they may be like minus 100 on the season already in goal differential. They're, they're minus 72 in goal differential, a nice little ode to double uh, A, uh, <laughs> Athanasiu, while well, he's injured, I suppose. So what's funny about that is uh, some folks were uh, tracking Athanasiu's quest to try to reach minus 100 because his pace was getting him into the upper 70s, but uh, it's likely that his injury has derailed his full season potential from uh, reaching that negative 100 and plus minus. God, you really hate to see an injury derail a quest for (laughs) such a noble record. Uh, All right, but people want to hear about players they actually want on their rosters i suppose nobody wants to hear about your red wings that's true um so yes top line top power play Ilya kovalchuk i'm with you that maybe not an ad in all formats but i mean he's probably should be like tonight is the night if you're in a cup full league where he hasn't been added he was added the, the night he signed in mine of course because nobody gets to stay on the waiver wire in tier two san jose whatsoever but um if he's on your waiver wire i would be as i'd be thrown in a bit at this point yeah, would you think you would rather have the red hot IX, Alex Ayafalo or this newly rejuvenated Kovalchuk in Montreal? Oh, for sure, I'd have. I'd rather have Kovalchuk. All right, good to know. <laughs> we'll move on. Over in Dallas, we have a bit of a power play one conundrum. Uh, Miro Haskinen is ice cold. Lewis, you referred to him as Miro Iskinen. Um, one point in his last eleven games. You know, he's still on pace for over 200 shots on goal. He's not going to be a big bangers guy, so your hits and blocks, he's not going to set the world on fire there. He's got an okay block total, but he is losing power play time to Essel Lindell. Of all people, I mean, John Klingberg is hurt, but Lindell on his own has been incredibly hot. Five points in his last three games, eight in the last ten. Two of those points are on the power play. Lewis, we added Lindell in our joint podcast league where we go up against other uh, other fantasy hockey podcasts and Twitter accounts, and I'm having trouble letting him go at this point. He's just been so, so, so hot. So, Lewis, I ask you, at this point, would you drop Miro Iskinen for Essa Lindell in all leagues? You know, I am really intrigued by Haskinen's shot pace. You know, uh, like Elon, I love a player with taking lots of shots, um, but certainly they don't have the value of the points. I feel like Haskinen would be a pretty safe drop. You might have people who are rushing to grab him, but we don't really know what it is that they are rushing to go grab, right? If he continues in this position, you know, it's you're taking a bit of a chance, but why not take the person who is being productive in their spot? They're going to need all the points they need. I think that I would drop Haskinen for Lindell. I think, yeah, I have Heiskanen in a keeper league, and I think I'm going to hold on to him there. Lindell is gone off the waiver wire at this point, but um, I just don't think that I would make that swap because I think that Heiskanen does have legit uh, long-term value. But overall, I wouldn't, you know, in a 10-team or 12-team redraft league, be overly opposed as long as you're not worried about um, about losing the shots and, you know, potentially you're giving up a top power play long-term defenseman. Uh, I don't think that Lindell is long for that role. Uh, this might just be me me being over safe, but I'm not personally ready to drop Miro Haskinen. I just think that the upside is there, and I think that he fits in well on that top unit. We've only seen Lindell there one or two games at this point, so for me, I'm I'm still a little hesitant to do that, but but I get it for sure. You know, one thing to think about is they're both likely going to see their value reduce somewhat when Klingberg returns. Uh, so if you are holding on to the player who's having less success, like. I agree with you that, you know, if he has the greater potential, like we could see Lindell move from kind of a number one position to a number three position behind Haskinen after uh, Klingberg returns. So that is something that I think is valuable to consider. Um, but yeah, you know, like I said, I think that he's not so valuable to me that I wouldn't be willing to take Lindell. And then if he cools off, stream in someone else who I can find. It depends on how barren your defensive uh, free agency is. Yeah, I mean, honestly, John Klingberg is not a concern to me anymore as a Miro Haskinen owner. Um, It's just been too long since he's had a grasp on that top power play unit, I think before his earlier injury in November. So, 
I'm not so worried about John Klingberg. Um, I am worried about this current cold streak because Haskinen's not getting the top unit stu- stuff. But I do think that that's where Dallas currently sees him. You know, we kind of talked about this being a Provorov versus Gostas Bear situation or a Petrangelo versus Shattenkirk situation. But I think that Haskinen fits in on that top unit in a very, very, uh, uh, in a different way. I think that he has better puck movement skills. I think that he's a better passer than Provorov. And he might not quite have the same shot, but I'd prefer a passer to a shooter on the power play as a defenseman anyway, just because the efficiency of a point shot is just not the same as that of a shot from in close. All right. Fair fair enough. I think uh, at any rate, I'm very much enjoying having you have uh, grabbed Lindell uh, for us in that podcast league. You're welcome. I uh, It's my penance for having dropped Shea Theodore. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lewis, we're going a little long here, so we are going to wrap up with one final headline, and this is a quickie because Brian and Neil had actually discussed it at length on Sunday's show. I encourage our listeners to go back and listen if they haven't yet. It's right at the beginning. You should stick around for the end because there's so much more fantasy analysis afterwards, but they went in deep on the Pittsburgh Penguins and what is going on there in the wake of the devastating Jake Gensel injury and the seeming possible return of Sidney Crosby maybe this week. He was on the ice for morning practice on Tuesday. He didn't end up taking line rushes, and he has not played against Vegas uh, here on Tuesday night. Um, but it definitely seems like he'll be back for one of these games, likely back for one of these games uh, during this fantasy week, potentially at Colorado on Friday or at Arizona on Sunday. So this will be useful for the usual cast of characters. Obviously, the wingers in the top six are going to benefit because they'll be lined up next to either Crosby or Malkin. It'll be beneficial for the power play. I'm really looking forward to its impact on the defensive side of things for the goalies. Uh, since I hold Murray and Jari in a couple leagues and just the fact that, you know, Crosby will help drive play. He'll c- help keep the puck in the other end and help hopefully generate some more wins for the goalies, I think is going to be a spot where we're going to feel the impact right away. You know, just nice to see Pittsburgh, which has been, uh, you know, a real walking dead situation this for much of this season uh, to start to get some people back off of the injury list. Those who are going to make it back during the fantasy season. I mean, how much better can they get? 7-2-1 and one in their last 10. As a team, they're protecting the goalies pretty well. I, I, they've, they've responded really well to Sidney Crosby missing so much time. I mean, one thing that we see consistently is when Crosby injures uh, his inevitable injuries. That's really when Malkin kind of goes ham mm-hmm. uh, and starts hitting paces, you know, that can reach into the 120s, 130s. Uh, and so that certainly is what we've seen from him. He's been excellent uh, ever since Crosby was out. Uh, and so it'll be, you know, I, it's hard, though, to see how getting Crosby back could make that any worse for for the Penguin situations, right? So uh, despite the fact that they've been playing great, I'm sure they'll be welcoming their captain back uh, pretty gleefully. Yeah, that is kind of the thing with a, a sport like hockey, right? It's, it's just like, even if you're adding a superstar, they're only playing 18 to 22 minutes a game in most cases. So the other 38 minutes... They're not on the ice. So I I think that obviously I'm not trying to say that getting Crosby back can't help, but I also don't see, I don't think they're going to win their next 40 games with him in the lineup. Yeah, I don't think it'll be the thing that tips the scale from winning most of their games to never losing a game. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, no, absolutely. You are correct that they should be a better team. They are a better team with him on the ice. And uh, yeah, quite the tear for them. I could see them uh, really making a run for at least second place in the Metro. The Capitals appear to be running away with that uh, division title, but 40 games is enough to make a little bit of noise in that division still. Lewis, we are out of time. I cannot believe how many, uh, how quickly the time flies when we are running through this many headlines and we are finally back in the regular cast seat on Thursday. We'll be bringing back our patron five where we're going to be doing five deep dives on five different players. If you want to join and vote on the players that we're going to chat about on Thursday's show, you can go to keepincarlson.com slash patron. You will get you will get perks like joining the patron only Facebook group where we hang out every single day, giving advice, answering questions, answering questions, 
asking our own questions. Honestly, when I have an issue, when I have a dilemma, I head to the Keeping Carlson patron group. I leave it in the group and I get that crowdsourced info from the Keeping Carlson family. It helps me make the most informed decisions possible as a fantasy owner. I hope to see you guys there. Until Thursday, I'm signing out of here. Lewis, why don't you take us home? All right. Well, we want to give credit to Natural Stat Trick, Micah Blake McCurdy on Twitter at Ineffective Math and on the forecheck for help with researching our episode. And we'll see you on Friday morning in your feeds. But until then, play smart and keep your shifts short.